Warning, some contents may be disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. I used to work the overnight shift at a certain 24 by 7 store that sold a bit of everything. You know that one. It's big. It's associated with a color blue and a big asterisk for their logo. You know which store I'm talking about. But if you don't, then you probably shop at the competitor with a big red circle. I think you get the picture that I'm trying to paint here. Anyways... I work for the store on the overnight shift for a few years, and I generally hated it. The worst part about working overnights in a department store is the customers. You get some real characters coming into the store at 3 in the morning. Well, okay, that's a bit of an exaggeration. Most of the people that came in overnight were decent people, just trying to get something last minute. That said, the people that wear the aforementioned characters were weird. We had a lot of people come in that were very clearly on some sort of substance or just completely trashed out of their minds. So, with this being the norm, you gotta think that if I have a horror story, that it has to be something truly terrifying, right? Well, that thought would be correct. There was one night that definitely stands out. One customer that definitely made an impact on my memory. This actually happened during my first year working there. Probably around month 9. One night, me and my new buddy Jack were working. We were stocking the shelves and making our comments about the customers when we knew that they were out of earshot. One of the customers was some guy that was on something again, because it was easy to tell. His eyes were wide, he was twitchy, and he looked paranoid about everything around him. Anyways, we watched this guy walk through the aisles like he was trying to find something. I actually paused and asked if he needed any help with anything, and he told me that he was fine in a tone that was incredibly dismissive. I just shrugged it off, and I went back to shoving items on the shelf. After a few minutes, Jack nudges me and tells me to come with him, so I do. We walk away from our stock point and into another aisle, where Jack then tells me that the guy from earlier, the paranoid guy, looked like he was following a woman that had passed by, and he wanted to make sure that we were ready just in case something happened. I mentioned that we should get a CSM involved, and he agrees, grabbing us walking and asking for a CSM to come to the section that we were staying in. We were standing off to the side and pretending to put more stuff on the shelf. When we hear the woman shriek, we both turn to see what was going on, and we seriously see this guy walking away from the woman with a baby in his arms. This guy had apparently waited for the woman to not be looking at the cart and then snatched this woman's infant son out of the seat, and he was walking away nonchalant like it was his kid. He wasn't running or making a full-on getaway. He was just walking away from the woman that was screaming at him to give back her child. Obviously, the commotion caught the attention of everyone nearby, which was pretty much just employees. And since Jack and I saw what happened, we went over to block the guy from getting too far. I started telling the guy to stop and to give back the baby, and Jack kept trying to actually physically stop the guy. It was pretty clear to me that he was getting agitated. The look on his face went from calm to angered, and he started muttering something about how we were trying to take his son from him. Then seemingly out of nowhere, he reaches his hand into his pocket, pulls out a small switchblade-looking knife, and then shoves it into Jack's arms as hard as he could. And then he continues to walk off while Jack is screaming bloody murder 
and the entire crowd of employees are freaking out. At this point, adrenaline kind of kicked in, and I knew that I had to do something. I pretty much threw myself onto this guy's back and started trying to choke him out as best as I could. I'm not really a strong guy or anything, but I used to watch a lot of wrestling, and while that may have been fake as hell, I learned a thing or two. So at this point, this guy has successfully stolen a child and was attempting to leave the store. He stabbed my coworker, who was now being choked out by me, all in a matter of around two minutes. If I were to say that this was the longest two or so minutes of my life, it would be an understatement. Thankfully, this story does have a happier ending than some. Once my co-workers saw me trying to take the man down, they stepped in and got the child out of his arms. It took a couple of us to actually get the guy to the ground, yet another side effect of being on certain substances. We got the baby back to the lady, but obviously asked her to stick around for the police. The CSM got to the back and tended to Jack, who thankfully was alright, just in immense pain though. And once the cops got there, I had to give a statement on what happened. I explained the whole situation, and what I told them was backed up with the security camera footage. In the end, he was taken by the police, and she got her baby back, and Jack got some time off work. I was also commended for my bravery, which it wasn't really bravery. It was pure adrenaline, and me, honestly having no idea what to do. Thankfully though, I think I chose the right option. In the early 2000s, I was killing time outside a small concert venue and it was going to be a while for the band to start. So, I decided to walk around the neighborhood a while and text my friends to see when they were showing up. It wasn't a bad neighborhood, and I didn't feel unsafe walking around. But at night, most things were closed, so there wasn't really anybody else around. As I was walking and looking at my phone, this guy in an SUV, like an Isuzu Rodeo or something, pulled up halfway on the sidewalk right next to me, and said something like, Hey, do you want a ride? I was slightly startled at first, but I thought that he was harmless. To be fair, I was in my skinny jeans, faux hawk, emo phase, and he might have thought that I looked like a male sex worker. When I looked closer at him, he had his shirt off and he was all sweaty and kind of a bigger, stocky guy. He tried again in a more seductive sounding voice saying, Really, I don't mind giving you a ride. I was pretty creeped out by this, but I tried to be friendly. I just kept my distance and said, Oh, thanks, but I'm good. I'm just waiting for the concert to start. Immediately, his facial expression changed from friendly to extremely angry and then he peeled out down the street so fast that his vehicle was sort of fishtailing. He could have been an undercover cop trying to bust someone for prostitution, or maybe just a guy trying to find a sexual encounter. It was in a city in Florida, where there was a lot of this kind of thing going on, but he gave me serious Jeffrey Dahmer vibes after he got angry and then drove off. I got the feeling that if I got in his car, he would have been taking me somewhere and then put me in his fridge. This happened several years ago when a few high school buddies of mine and I decided that we wanted to get together and do our own kind of 10-year reunion celebration. We were never the cool kids, so we kind of just thought that it would be a waste of time to even bother with a real reunion 
and decided that a camping trip would be better to fit our interest. We had all kind of dispersed around the Midwest, so it was difficult to get all of the logistics sorted out. But my buddy Ray had a family that lived out west in pretty much the middle of nowhere, but in a really nice nature-laden part of the state. What was even better is that they owned some remote land and they were okay with us setting up our camp on their property so long as we didn't cause any damage to the natural formations. So it was an absolute win on our part. We set up the dates and times and decided that we would all go out the first weekend in May and then spend most of the week out in a really nice area, just enjoying the weather and the surrounding nature. I was honestly super excited to go on this trip as I hadn't seen a couple of the guys since we graduated, though we'd kept in touch over things like Facebook. The logistics went like this. I was going to head out that way by car with my pal Joe. Ray and Mark were going to drive out together, and Brent was going to drive out with Dave. Basically, it was going to be a road trip with two of us per car, heading from different locations, and we had a hotel that we'd be staying in for the first night. We were all going to meet up there and then head out to the campgrounds, as that would just make it easier for everyone to go at the same time. Like I said, I was pretty psyched, as this was probably the most exciting thing that I had done in a long time, and I love road trips. The drive there goes about as expected, fairly uneventful, with it pretty much just being a drive across parts of the Midwest. Though... The mountainous region was obviously gorgeous. I was the one driving for the first half and Joe for the second, and we got there in pretty good time considering how far it was. We were the second group to make it to the hotel, and the other guys, Ray and Mark, pulled in a few hours later. We all spent the night at a local bar catching up. We were playing pool and generally just having a great night. After spending a few hours out and just enjoying ourselves, we opted to go ahead and call it a night and then head back to our hotel rooms. When the morning rolled around, we had our fancy hotel breakfast of just add water eggs and microwave bacon, then all headed back onto the road. We followed race car and after about 45 minutes or so, we ended up in the area that pretty much seemed like the middle of nowhere. He parked and then got out. Joe and I kind of gave him a look like, Are you sure this is where we're supposed to be? But he reassured us that he knew the area from when he spent the summer with his aunt as a kid. And in the end, all we could do was trust him. We parked the cars and got all of our camping gear out, we then walked a couple hundred yards away until we had all decided that the spot was perfect, and then we started setting up. After a bit of time, we all got our tents set up, and we decided to set them up with the six tents in a semicircle, all facing toward where we had parked the cars. Once night started rolling around, we set up our small pit and then lit a fire. Then we all just sat around it, and started reminiscing about our years in high school. It was probably one of the best nights that I'd had in a long time, just sitting there with my old pals from high school, talking about the days when we were young, and then catching up on random things in our lives. What made it all the better was that the property owned by Ray's aunt was legitimately in the middle of nowhere. There were only dirt roads, there were no street lights, and there was no cell reception. It was probably around 10 or so when Brent pointed out that there was a car driving down one of the dirt roads. We all kind of sat there and watched it pass. It was pretty far away from us, but it was the only car that we'd seen all night. Hurray laughed and said that it was probably just one of the neighbors 
cutting through the back roads for whatever reason. He mentioned that the dirt roads over this way were used pretty much by the people that knew his aunt and people that were running illegal goods, mostly because the cops never came this way. Dave asked about what kind of illegal goods and, as nonchalantly as he could be, Ray just says, Oh, drugs for the cartel. Obviously, we were all a bit shaken by that. He didn't tell us that we were going to be sleeping on a cartel trail. He tells us that it's fine and that we didn't have to worry. His reasoning was pretty much that if they were running drugs across the area, they weren't going to pay them any mind because it would look more suspicious. They would just pass on by and keep going and never giving us a second glance. Again, all we could do was trust him. After a couple hours of chatting and drinking, after a couple more hours of chatting and drinking the beer that we had brought, we all decided that it would be a good idea to call it a night. We got into our tents, and I was struggling to fall asleep for some dumb reason. I was lying there for about half an hour, tossing and turning, and just generally feeling uncomfortable. When I noticed that there was a light shining in the direction of our tents. I sat up, and I watched it get brighter and closer for a few moments. And then it stopped moving. Within a few moments, the silence of the small forest was interrupted with the sound of a gunshot and a man yelling for all of us to get out of our tents. Inside, I was freaking out, obviously thinking something about the cartel coming to rob us or murder us for being on their turf. And in my defense, I was tired and a bit buzzed. He started shouting again that if we didn't get out of our tents, he was going to have to get us out and that he had plenty of zip cuffs to make it happen. Which was more than enough for me to get my ass up and open the door to the tent. I think the other guys were just as freaked out because everyone else exited their tent around the same time. Everyone, except Bray. We all got out and in front of us was an old man holding a handgun in his right hand and a shotgun strapped to his back. It was pretty clear that he was in control of this situation and that he was going to be ready to take on any threats. I remember him saying something along the lines of, I saw you boys out here a few hours ago. I gave you plenty time to leave. Now we're going to have to do this the hard way. Before he unclip his collection of zip cuffs. All of us were in a mild panic, but apparently I was the only one that thought that we should say something. I said, Wait, sir, we know who owns this land. We're not here to cause any trouble or anything. If we need to leave, we can find a new place to set up camp or go back to a hotel or something. He paused for a moment and then looked over at me. He then asked me how we knew the owner, and I tried to tell him that she was a family member of one of us, but he was still in his tent. At first, he looked like he didn't believe me. But after I pointed to the only closed tent and said that he was in there, he motioned for me to open the tent and said, Don't do anything stupid. You move wrong at all and they'll be burying you out here. This statement made me all but piss my pants, but I moved over to the tent with my hands up and I then slowly unzipped it. I tried to wake Ray up by saying, Ray, get up! There's a crazy dude with a gun out here. Of course, he had more to drink than I did, and he was less than responsive. I whisper shouted it again, and after a few seconds, he finally opened his eyes. I told him that we needed him outside immediately because we were all about to die. He slowly and groggily sits up, then stands to get out of the tent. And after a few seconds of taking in the scenes, he half drunkenly says, Oh, Mr. Carls, what are you doing out here? 
the look on the old man's face changed completely. He went from murderous intent to looking like he just saw his own grandson for the first time. He quickly holstered his gun and then stepped forward to give Ray a hug. After the tensions were a bit more settled and we were done having our panic attacks, we learned who this man was. Ray told us that Mr. Carl's was his aunt's next-door neighbor and had been for as long as they lived there, and apparently, the last time they'd seen each other, Ray was around 12. When we asked why he was creeping around on Ray's aunt's property, ready to put a new hole in anyone he saw. Apparently, his aunt was out of town and asked Mr. Carls to watch the property for trespassers, a job that the old man took very seriously. Also, his aunt had apparently forgotten to mention to the old man that we would be coming up for our camping trip, so when he saw our camp, he thought that we were going to be there for a little bit and leave which was a common thing for drifters. But when he saw that we were still there, he apparently strapped up and decided that he was going to take us all into the sheriff's department himself, hence the zip cuffs. In the end, we stayed the full week and enjoyed time together. Mr. Carls even came out to have a beer with us a couple times, and he also brought us some food that his wife has made for us. Not exactly the norm for camping cuisine, but it was quite nice. I will say that, as much as I really did enjoy this trip and hanging out with some old friends of mine, having a gunshot right outside of my tent and then pointed at my face because an old man thought that we were trespassers has made it to where I really don't think that I want to go camping again. This happened to me while I was still in high school. I lived in a fairly nice neighborhood. There were hardly any police around unless Mr. Jefferson on the corner called about a noise disturbance. There was a younger couple that lived across the street from him and they always had parties for any event in almost every weekend and he hated it. Otherwise, the neighborhood was peaceful and everyone got along. I was one of the younger boys in the neighborhood that would rake leaves, shovel the snow, walk dogs, and I got paid for it too. I was 16 and made my own money, and I was able to do whatever I wanted with it. I also had started house-sitting for a few of our close neighbors too, and those were some of my favorite times. I would go over to their house and if they had animals, I would feed them, let them out to play with them, and just chill around. And most of them had snacks and drinks that they said I was also welcome to. I had two older brothers, so I didn't normally get to watch what I wanted on TV. So I would just enjoy a soda and watch something for a few hours before I left for the day. One summer... Our neighbors two houses down were going to be going out of state for two weeks to see their daughter in college, and they asked if I could watch their house. They said that they would pay me a hundred dollars, so I was in. I could ditch my friends a few hours early each day and make some easy money. They had some pretty simple requests. They had a dog so I would feed and give her water then let her out the back and clean up after her. They also asked me to get their mail and to flush the toilet if I don't use it. Otherwise, it would drain or something, and then it would mess up with the pipes. Then, of course, just clean up after myself if I made any mess. But otherwise, I had free reign of their home. I had walked their dog, Penny, plenty of times in the past, so I knew her well. She was part lab and very kind and playful. She had a dog bed in their back office, so when I would come in, I would just haul her for her and she would come running up to me. I would then let her out back 
and we'd play fetch for a while before going back in. The first few nights went as normal. I remember I had gone back over to the neighbor's place for the second time, around 7 or 8 at night, as it was just starting to get dark. My brothers had a few friends over, and they were starting to annoy me, so I used the neighbor's place as an excuse to go over there and just get away for a while. I came in, and Penny was already at the door waiting for me. I thought she probably needed out, so I just went to open the door, but she didn't move. She sat in the kitchen and just stared at me. So I just shut the door, I gave her a treat, and I went to the office to play a game on their computer just to kill some time. Usually Penny would come back to the room and sit on her bed, but I noticed that she never followed me. I went to see where she was when I noticed her on her back legs trying to look out the window to the back door. I tried opening the door again to let her out as she just stood there with her tail down looking out back and then at me. I was kind of annoyed, most likely due to my brothers, but this added to it so I just shut the door and I tried to push her away from the door. She again would not move. She just fell over and just laid on the floor in front of the door. As I was becoming more irritated, I just gave up and I decided to take a shower to chill out some. While I was in there, I started hearing their home phone ring. Sometimes they would call if I was there to check in or leave a message on their machine for me in case they forgot to ask me to do something. Not thinking much of it, I just made a mental note to check the messages when I got out. While I was drying off, it dawned on me that it only rang like three or four times, so maybe it was a wrong number. But then, I started hearing Penny barking. I got dressed, and I went out to see what she was barking at, and I noticed that she was again staring out the window. I went to open the door again when the phone started ringing, so I went and picked it up and it was Mary Ann, the wife that lived there. She started asking me all these questions like if I had a friend over there with me or how long I had been there. I was trying to answer her all the while, trying to get Penny to stop barking when Mary Ann noticed this as well and asked her what she was barking at. I tried explaining that she had just been staring out and barking at the back window. I then heard her to tell Martin in the background to call 911. That's when she told me that she just called and someone else had answered the phone. She said it sounded like an older guy trying to sound younger like me. She asked who he was and where I was. Thinking that I had brought a friend over when the guy hung up on them. I certainly didn't bring anyone over with me, so she told me to take Penny out the front door and wait out front and stay on the phone with her. At this point, I was freaking out. I was alone, or so I thought. As someone else appeared to have come in while I was in the shower, I grabbed Penny's leash and I finally got her to go out the front door with me while staying on the phone. It felt like I was standing there, looking around to make sure that no one was hiding. My dad and my brothers all ran over thanks to Martin calling them shortly before the cops arrived. I explained what happened the best that I could, and then they walked around the house to see if they could find anyone. They saw footprints along the side of the house that went to the back door. They dusted for prints on the outside knob, but I don't know whatever came of that. They didn't normally lock their back door. They left it unlocked in case they were ever locked out or if their older kids came over when they weren't home. However, they also didn't have a very secured fence to keep people out. You could just lift the metal latch to get in, meaning anyone had access to their yard. 
They didn't end up catching anyone that night, and I had to have my mom or dad go with me for the remainder of time that they were away. I think they ended up coming back a few days earlier. They paid me the $100 and also gave me a gift card for something. I don't really remember since I had to go through that. Sometime that same year, there was another break-in and the people that lived there actually came home while they were going through their stuff. They caught the guy though and it turned out that it was the same one that tried robbing the house that I sat for. The scary part was that the guy had a knife on him. Who knows if he did when he broke into the house that I was in, but it was pretty terrifying to think about. What could have happened if I was still in the office or if I had walked out of the bathroom to answer the phone? On a better note though, they did put up a privacy fence after that and started locking the doors so my parents and I were both more comfortable with me going over there for future trips. I also pay more attention to Penny when she's acting differently. I think she was trying to tell me that there was someone out there that shouldn't be. So, always lock your doors and trust the dog's instincts. This happened before Christmas of 2019, when I, a female, was 26, and it sticks with me to this day. I've thought about sharing this many times before, but I was never sure if it was scary enough, so I guess you have to decide that. My then boyfriend, now husband, and I decided to meet for dinner at a Christmas market here in Switzerland. He would pick up our dog from doggy daycare, and I would get there after work. Some things that are good to know, at that point, we'd had our dog for about a year now. He's called Bean, he's a medium-sized dog, and before he came to Switzerland, he was a street dog in Italy. He was about two and a half years old at that time, and he loved and still loves to get all the attention that he can get. Also, Christmas markets are incredibly busy here, especially after work. People will meet there with their friends to eat dinner and drink mulled wine. When we got to this Christmas market, we realized that it was way busy to walk through with a dog. So, I sent my boyfriend off to get my favorite street food. And I waited at the edge of the market with Bean. Bean likes to greet everyone who looks at him, and by that point... I had gotten used to talking with the strangers because my dog wanted to meet them, so I wasn't too concerned at first when a dude came up to me. Full transparency, I don't remember word for word what he said. I'm not even sure what language this happened in. But I do remember that Bean happily greeted this guy. He was trying to stand up against him and also licking his hands. The guy asked for his name and what breed he is, and I told him that Bean is a pincher mix. That's when the situation started to turn. This man insisted that he must be a Basenji, and that how could I say that he's a pincher? All of a sudden, he switched. There was no better word to explain it. He grabbed Bean's leash and said, I'll go now and just tried to walk off with my dog. Thankfully, I had a firm grip on his leash. I was incredibly confused and flustered and just stammered that he can't take my dog. He got increasingly more angry with every second that I didn't let go of the leash. I loudly told him to leave me alone, and Bean started to bark at the man. I have never seen Bean this angry and scared at the same time. And thankfully... The man let go of the leash and slipped into the crowd. I was left standing there, a dumbfounded mess with a mess of a dog. Bean was barking and shaking, so I knelt down to calm him. I was holding him and I was talking to him. My boyfriend was still somewhere in the crowd waiting for our food. And after a while, 
a woman walked up to me and told me not to put my heel to the floor as she'd just seen someone put a firecracker there. I don't know the name for this type of firecracker. They were small like one fourth of an inch and usually thrown at the floor to make a little boom sound on impact. Someone had put them under the heel of my shoe so it would explode when I put my heel down to get up. Now, I don't know what's worse. Was it the same guy that tried to steal Bean, or was it someone else who saw a distressed dog and thought, Wow, let's scare that dog a bit more. I think the worst thing for me was that apart from that woman who warned me, no one helped me when I was harassed by a weird guy, even though I loudly told him to go away. There were other people standing very close just watching. Bean was the one who scared off the guy in the end. Thankfully, the events of that evening had no lasting impact on Bean. He still loves to greet strangers. I still remember it, and I don't think that I will ever forget. When my parents were still together, my younger brother and I went to a public school for elementary and middle school until they split up. My mom got custody of us and remarried. However, because of my stepdad's job, we had to move. My stepdad, Charles, was a bit too uppity in my opinion, which then began to warp my mother into the same type of person. Because of this, they felt our family was too good for public schools, so we had to go to private schools when we moved. Don't get me wrong, I'm sure there were plenty of kids there that enjoyed it. My brother was still in elementary school, and he seemed to like it, but I hated it. Most of the teachers were really strict. If you were late at all, even if it was because you just had locker troubles, you were sent away, and your parents knew about it that night. Thankfully, there were some kids that were like me, forced into private schools thinking that it was a better education and that it would save the troubled kids. We would grin and bear it, and then have our fun outside of school. Thankfully, most of our parents felt that we had to be good kids too, and didn't question us hanging out with each other. That was our chance to ride on our bikes and skateboards around. We would take turns, playing on our handhelds, as long as we wanted, and just explore places that we shouldn't have. Some of my friends were a little more intense than the others, like bringing alcohol to school. I'd be lying if I said that I didn't partake in any. I suppose... It was my way of acting out. I only got to see my dad on weekends and some holidays, and I didn't want to move or go to a new school and then meet new friends. I had to leave that all behind, and like it was no big deal for me. I was never happy about that. So, after school games, we would hang out and enjoy some party time, free of adults. Just to explain a little bit as to where we would hang out, our school was pretty secluded. It had a long entrance and a pretty big parking lot in the front that wrapped around the side and into the back, which is where the buses parked to drop us off and then pick us up. Behind the school and parking lot was our track field, and behind that and on the one side, it was still fenced off by trees and a lot of them. I knew the woods went back pretty far because, during one of the track meets, one of the girls on the team, Dana, had gone back there with me and we made out. It was an awesome place to go to hide from others and just chill. They just had a small gate that went over the entrance, so it was easy for us to sneak over it to come and go. At this time, Dana and I had started seeing each other quite regularly. Her parents seemed nice enough, but of course, being kids still, neither of our parents wanted us to be alone. So, the closest alone time that we got 
was at these parties and track meets. It was a Friday night and we were going to meet our friends at the school to just hang out for a while. The five of us got there, set up our little crappy radio, and Dylan shared the refreshments. We were all just talking, complaining about school, and then laughing at things that happened and enjoying our time there. I think it was about an hour in or so when Dana said that she had to use the restroom, so she was going in the trees and told us not to go in there. I waved her on and we kept talking. I was a bit buzzed at this point and didn't realize that Dana hadn't come back yet till one of the girls mentioned it. We agreed to have one of them go look for her in case there was something wrong. And after a few more minutes, she came back saying that she still couldn't find her. I was just thinking either she didn't look hard enough, or maybe Dana was either hiding or passed out. So I pulled out my little flashlight and I started looking for her. After several minutes and calling out for her to no avail, I went back to see if maybe she had made her way back in. She had not come back. At this point, I was starting to get a bit flustered, first getting mad at them, seeing that the prank they were doing wasn't funny. But when their face was just as concerned was when I started to really get scared. We gathered our stuff and started looking around for her. One of the girls, Tammy, tried to call and text her, but Dana just had a little prepaid phone so we didn't know how much time she had on it, but both went and answered. We called out for her, paired up and still nothing. We ended up making our way to the other side of the trees, which seemed to be a gravel road, but there was no trace of her. At this point, with all of us out of ideas and terrified, we had to call an adult. Tammy called her sister since she was the one that dropped her and her friend off here. We explained to her what happened and she also suggested that we call our parents. None of that was pleasant. We had to explain what we were doing out there and we had to explain every detail as to where we stayed, where she went, and full statements. Which also meant our parents now knew. So yeah, I got grounded but I didn't even care about that. The police were out looking for Dana that night, but they never found her. I know there were rumors floating around about her running away or maybe being kidnapped, but I just knew that she wouldn't have ran away. She wasn't really troubled. She seemed just like us, but never hinted she wanted to leave. It was about two or three weeks later when they finally found her. She ended up stumbling into a gas station wearing something like a nightgown and then they called the cops. Unfortunately, the rest of this is just from what I've heard from the news and rumors. I heard at school that the person working at the gas station that night saw her come in and she looked disheveled and malnourished, but she didn't say much to the guy other than wanting to go home. She never returned to school and never saw her when she returned. I asked my parents if they would take me to see her and they were hesitant at first, but surprisingly, my mom said that she would ask if she could have company. Unfortunately, as I was told when I got older, her parents wanted nothing to do with us, thinking that I may have had something to do with it. I guess the cops didn't though because I was never brought back for another statement or anything. Or maybe that was Dana reaffirming our innocence. Apparently, she didn't talk about it for a while though. I wouldn't learn what had really happened until I saw it on the news. I started putting the pieces together based on the questioning that some of us students were getting by the police and other teachers at school. It was them basically looking for a person in the questioning of her abduction. The person in question was one of our substitute teachers. School definitely felt different and even among the teachers, 
but I didn't realize that may have had something to do with it. He did end up getting caught, sickeningly, him and his wife both. It was stated that Dana was pretty close to them as she had started dog-sitting for them and got to know the couple. That night, he was driving by and apparently Dana had made her way through the trees and he stopped her and then he put her in his car. He then took her home and they kept her there that whole time. She managed to sneak out at some point and just took off to find help. I felt awful and at times, I still do, thinking that I could have prevented all of this, but I've gone through counseling since to try and help. I've also since graduated from a different school, of course, but I still have not had any contact with her. I just hope that she's been able to move on and live a happy life since. Easter isn't a religious holiday for my family. My family tend to give each other a chocolate egg and just hang around the house doing nothing to celebrate it, especially as the younger kids got older and became teenagers. And I was included in this number. There was one Easter event that we used to do that. We stopped it after this incident occurred, though. The adults in the family would wake up really early or stay up really late drinking, depending on the night to hide Easter eggs around the garden. We'd all get tiny baskets to carry and stash our eggs in. My family would go all out. We would invite cousins or friends over to take part in the event and I absolutely loved it. There would be tiny eggs, big eggs, and it was the envy of all the local kids. I also need to add that I don't have a small backyard by any means. I live on a quarter of an acre block, and yes, the Easter egg hunt takes place on it, so we are out there for a long time. There are a lot of trees and shrubs to hide in, and this is important for later on. Like the rest of the kids, I grabbed my basket and then sped off in the hunt of sweet, sweet chocolate. I may have pushed past my younger brothers, and I'm not the first to deny that it's survival of the fittest when it comes to getting the chocolate goodness. At the end of the driveway, I saw a boring-looking man holding a bunch of Easter eggs. He was hiding behind one of the trees talking to himself and laughing. I'd love to say there was something really off about him, but he just looked so... average, almost non-threatening. He didn't notice me at first. I was going to call out for the adults in the family that someone had stolen our eggs. But then, he noticed me. He told me that he had even more chocolate like this in his car. And I know my reaction is weird, but I just laughed at him. This was one of the weird style of pranks members of my family would play on each other. I know, I know. We all have a sick sense of humor. But he looked angry that I laughed at him and that only made it more funny. Again, we have a strange sense of humor. He told me to hurry up and come with him. I told him no and to give me back the chocolate that he stole. He argued with me and he was getting really angry like he had to be somewhere in a hurry and wanted me to come along with him. Not a chance. Some of the younger kiddos heard what was happening and came to see what the fuss was all about. It was only when he asked them and tried to grab one of their arms that I knew something was up. I screamed and made as much noise as possible. He tried to tell me to shut up. He offered me money. Then he threatened me and tried to drag me away by the arm. I struggled to get away he held me so hard that he left marks on my arm and the rest of my family managed to chase him off. Fortunately, no one got seriously hurt. Now, the outcome of what happened? Well, the police never found the guy. 
They took statements and the community was warned about him. No idea who he was and haven't seen him since that day. But the rumor around town is that he tortured small animals as a child and was now moving on to human prey. Nat was seen stealing random items of clothing and trying to spy on women while they changed. It was typical small town gossip that may or may not be true. But either way, no one saw him again. The unfortunate outcome is that now we don't do the Easter egg hunt and we're just given our chocolate eggs. I miss how it used to be something fun that we all did and how one creep managed to change something special. I hate how it ruined a family tradition for us, but better that than one of the kids being grabbed. I worry about what could have happened if one of the more gullible kids came, and I dread to think what that absolute creep's intentions were. The last thing I remembered from it is seeing some chocolate eggs all stepped on and mashed up on the grass. I don't really eat chocolate anymore. Back in high school, there was this guy that tended to keep to himself. I'll call him Jeff. Jeff was a loner type. He talked to a few of the goths and a few people from the football team, but it was typically in passing or during lunch. I never saw them around each other long term, so I'm not sure how close any of them were. But I think that it was mutual to a lot of us though that there was something off about him. I went to elementary school with Jeff. He was alright then. He seemed like a pretty smart kid though. He was also an only child, so I think being around other young children and having to share in play fair wore on him. I remembered him getting upset when he was told that he had to share the swing or slide at recess time, and when he would get in trouble or be asked to do something, he would occasionally throw a tantrum, throw things and even break things, as a, if I can't play with it, no one else can. I just steered clear from him as much as I could from then on. I didn't see much of him in middle school, but he reappeared in high school. I know his parents had split up and he was staying with his mom, but there were rumors that his dad killed himself when they split up and that's why he only lives with his mom. High school was weird. As mentioned, I didn't really interact with him but I seemed to be one of the people that he recognized from elementary, so he would say hi or good morning to me in passing. We had biology and art class together, and he still had his moments where he would be cool at first, and then something would set him off and he'd get irrationally angry. I remember in biology class, we had to dissect a frog and we were in groups of three. Of course, I would get paired with him and another girl too. She was the quiet type, typically kept to herself, and she tended to be very direct to the point when it came to group assignments. We had to do some simple tagging for like the heart, the lungs, and etc. Jeff wrote out the tags, and then we all took turns placing them. However, Jeff seemed to really enjoy piercing the organs. He would make sound effects as he pushed them in, or make gross jokes about it. Angel, our partner, obviously was uncomfortable with it. But since I knew him some, I would always tell him things like, Ah, oh, knock it off. And, come on man, grow up. And towards the end of the class, when we had turned around to listen to the teacher about cleaning up, we were facing away from Jeff. But when we turned back around, we were disgusted to find out that Jeff had cut off the frog's legs and he was playing with them. 
Who the hell in their right mind would do that? Angel had had enough. I could tell by the way that she screamed at Jeff and then walked out of the room. This got the whole class's attention and the teacher came over to see. Everyone had to clean up and I was told to go check on Angel while Jeff had to clean his crime scene. She was okay, but the bell was just about to ring when we walked back in. Jeff was still sitting at the tall table where we were at and was told to stay behind afterwards. And by the look of Jeff's face and the teacher's face, they were both annoyed. Another occurrence was around April 1st. It was a standard day with normal pranks from students and teachers alike. All very light-hearted things and not damaging. But during that week, there was this bad smell growing. At first, we thought it was possibly the sewage. We saw some maintenance people in the restrooms, so we thought something broke. But when they left and the smell didn't go away for another day or so, we had a feeling that it wasn't that. The stench grew worse, and people started making rumors about it smelling like something died. They had to check all of the biology and anatomy classes to make sure that there wasn't something that wasn't stored properly. Class was actually called off one Friday so they could investigate it further. We found out about it when we came back because we were told about it in each class so I heard the story for eight times. Somehow... There were several dead rabbits found in the intake fence throughout the school so they had to remove them. They used cameras to make sure that they got everything. They cleaned and aired it out to finally get the smell out. So in each class, we were asked if we knew anything about it and to tell any of the staff if we did. At first, we were all confused and disgusted, but of course... I had biology for my second hour, and Jeff thought that it was hilarious. He made little smirks and comments about it, and my guess is that he had to have done it or had a part in it. Not to mention, the vents they were put in were in the boys' restrooms, not even the girls. So I'm pretty sure that he ended up being punished for it. I don't know if he admitted it or if they had proof somehow but he was out of school for a bit shortly after that. One of the last horrifying memories that I have with him was in art class. One thing he had going for him was that he was a fantastic artist. With just about every medium, he nailed it. He was good with acrylics, charcoal, and even with things like paper mache. However, a lot of his work was dark, or displayed nudity. He was detailed with it though, like it was actually artistic and not just lewd, which is why I think he got away with it. He was told not to make it so obvious, but otherwise, unless there was a specific topic or theme, the teacher let him make whatever he wanted. There was one project where we had to take an old book and do what we wanted to make it our own art. Some people glued or bound the pages together and carved it into something else. Many made theirs into their own art book, almost like a personal portfolio. Well, Jeff made his into a very graphic flip book in a way. I remember looking at it when they were on display in the classroom. Some of them were displayed in the art window, but the ones that aren't as good or, in Jeff's case, a bit inappropriate... They were displayed in the room. At least the teacher was respectful to others' work. I could appreciate that. Anyways, doing this from memory here, his book started with painted black pages, and it seemed to zoom out of a child's eye to the front profile of the child holding a gun and crying. It then showed the gun firing, but it wasn't a bullet. It exploded into a bunch of psychedelic-looking stuff. The next pages were filled with a lot of color, optical illusions, little cartoon characters, and a smiling naked woman surrounded by flowers. 
That somehow changed over to a man with his stomach bloodied and then zoomed into the man's eye and was blank for the rest of the book. It was crazy detailed, but also disturbing. I always wondered if it had something to do with his mom and dad, but I would never know. That was the horrifying part. I just wanted to share the book because it was so crazy. One of the other projects that we would have was for the final. We had to create something that combined at least four mediums or styles that we learned. We had about two to three weeks to do it. The first few days while everyone worked, Jeff just sat there with a blank paper and pencils. Usually he was quick to work in art, so to see him sitting there empty with nothing, even scribbles, was kind of odd. On the last week we had left, he was still sitting there, but this time, he had a glue, scissors, and a canvas. The teacher had asked him if he needed any help or inspiration, and he didn't take his eyes off the table and just said no. I sat across from him, so I looked over occasionally, and I saw that he had grabbed the scissors. I started getting a bad feeling about this. I got up to pretend to go get paint, since it was close to the door, and I stopped to talk to someone else that was standing nearby. That's when someone screamed, and we all looked over. Jeff had the scissors up to his head, and he was cutting his ear off. There was blood everywhere, and he just kept going. Several people left the classroom, and I just stood there in fear, not knowing what to do. The teacher started shouting at him to stop and to drop the scissors, but he kept going. We had a security guard at the school that rushed in and basically had to fight to get the scissors away from him. And once it was all said and done, they had an ambulance come to get him, and the janitors had to go in and clean the room. However, as he was escorted out, he kept laughing and shouting. That was going to be his whole art project, his ear. He was obviously gone for the remainder of the year, and I haven't seen him since. I don't know what happened to him, but I hope that he got help. He seems smart and very artistic, but he definitely needed help. And here's the riddle for this video. Hello everyone, it's your creepy sister here. Thank you so much for watching the video. I really appreciate each and every one of you. But I would also like to thank my amazing patrons, my top tippers, and my dearest channel members. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it with all of my heart. If you want to support the channel further, you could also choose to become a patron, a tipper, or a channel member. But remember, it's appreciated, but never a requirement. I would also like to announce that we have merch now. The link is in the description of the video, along with all my other social media links, like my Discord server, Twitter, Instagram, and others. You can connect with me and send your stories there. And don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't yet, and comments are highly appreciated. And remember, your fear feeds me.